According to caregiver.org, women make up 65% of the caregivers in the U.S., and they make up 80% of the healthcare workforce, according to the advisory board. Yet in Rock Health's 2017 Women in Healthcare report, they filled only 22% of the board seats in Fortune 500 healthcare companies. And even now, the 2019 Fortune 500 report lists only one female CEO of a Fortune 500 healthcare company, Anthem's Gail Boudreaux. There's got to be something we can do to change that, right? Hello, and welcome to the Data Point Podcast, where we focus on all the ways that data and analytics are driving innovation in healthcare today. I'm your host, Greg Matthews, and our guest this week is Aisha McCracken, president of Innovate Health Ventures and the founder of the Ignite Healthcare Network. Aisha has had the unique opportunity to play a leadership role at amazing organizations like Texas Children's, Houston Methodist, and Memorial Hermann, and is a huge believer in the power of innovation to solve healthcare's biggest problems. This year, she'll also be hosting the third annual Ignite Fire Pitch, an incredible opportunity for women-run startups to partner with world-class healthcare companies to fine-tune their offering directly with their potential customers. Applications are due by June 15th at ignitehealthcare.org, so don't miss this opportunity to participate. Aisha even has some pro tips for applicants at the end of our interview, so make sure you listen all the way to the end. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Aisha McCracken as much as I did. Aisha, thanks so much for being with us on Data Point. Thanks for having me, Greg. It is uh, good to be here together. You and I met each other several years ago when you were in your uh, Memorial Hermann Medical Group days, but a lot has uh, a lot has changed since then, and I'm really excited about diving into it with you. Um, I mentioned in our introduction uh, that we're going to talk a little bit specifically about the Ignite Healthcare Fire Pitch competition that's coming up. But before we do that, I would love for our listeners to get a little bit of a sense of who you are and how you came to be so passionate about innovation and technology and healthcare and particularly women's role uh, in innovation and technology for healthcare. Can you give us a little bit of a, of, of a background? Well, I'd be delighted to. Thank you. Um, I've had um, a long and really great career um, working in healthcare. Um, I had a grandfather, I'm Turkish, I had a grandfather who, who was a surgeon, so I was always sort of drawn to healthcare as, um, as a profession. However, I became an accountant coming out of college and had the opportunity to work for Arthur Anderson where my clients were hospitals. Mm. So that opened the door for an accountant to have a, an incredible career um, working in healthcare. Um, I worked uh, originally uh, or initially for um, companies that were publicly traded and um, were owners of hospitals and got involved with acquisitions and growth-related strategies and then started getting calls um, from uh, young venture-backed companies that were doing new things in healthcare. So you got to think this is 1980s. <laughs> I'm taking okay. you back a while. Okay. And, um, but what I developed was a real interest in growth and innovation and continued improvement in an industry that I found fascinating and, and, and appealed to me um, from both the human perspective of doing good for people, mm -hmm. at the same time from a business perspective of how um, the business models could change and continue to grow. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of the entry into healthcare. But when I came to work for Arthur Anderson in 1981, um, it was a big deal that there were two female partners in all of Arthur Anderson worldwide. So, um, right. So things were a little different and, and, um, it was, it was a time where, you know, we were, um, still wearing Navy suits and, and, um, there was a moment where we had to wear sort of didn't have to, but there were bow ties that sort of, mocked men's ties, I think. And uh -huh. so it was quite an evolution in terms of, of um, females in the workforce and where we are today is remarkable. I mean, there, there's still room for continued um, evolution and promotion of uh, women's advancement um, professionally. But I've seen a lot in, in the course of my career. So when I married um, my professional involvement in healthcare and, and seeing the opportunities, the business opportunities there with 
the number of women who are in healthcare, so 80% of healthcare workers are women, and wow. 40% of healthcare executives are women. Okay. And if you take that 40% of executives and just look at the top CEOs of healthcare organizations, that reduces, I don't know the fraction, but I could tell you, you know, in Houston, in all the healthcare systems that are here, hospital systems, there isn't a single female CEO. Wow. A lot of, yeah, so, you know, you work with a lot of really bright women who have a lot of, of capability, but there's still something missing in terms of getting to those top jobs. So um, that's sort of what brought my interest in, in um, innovation. I've always had a career that has um, been focused around building companies. I built new companies in health systems, um, the companies that employed uh, physicians in the hospital organizations were mm-hmm. the area where I spent the bulk of my career. And um, yet, you know, uh, being able to take that innovation now to digital um, technology and continuing to advance that and with Ignite, being able to even focus more narrowly on bringing together women to support the advancement of uh, women in the healthcare industry and with our um, fire pitch, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little later, um, fire pitch is a pitch event that showcases the best of women-led technologies. So there's a, there's a natural innovation, uh, natural um, evolution that sort of happened over the course of my 38-year career. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> but who's counting? All, I, I need to tell you, I can completely relate to the Arthur Anderson experience. I actually started with Anderson, although on the consulting side, in 1990 when I got out of college. And so I was a, a few years behind you, but it was still lots of dark suits and, uh, yep. you know, for the women, the the bows and so forth. It was a uh, uh, not the free and easy place that I'm sure Accenture is today. Um, in any case, I'm really curious, through the course of your career, you started in roles that, you know, you mentioned you started, had an accounting degree. You went to work for a management consulting firm that had an audit and tax focus. It, it, did you at any point sort of cross the Rubicon to the point where you're thinking outside the finances and thinking about the clinical work that was happening and the patient experience and uh, the impact of technology on those aspects of care? Um, or you know, h- how do you see that balance for you as an executive? Yeah, I think my finance background, um, I always thought I would be sort of a CFO and, and, and more in a, uh, a finance lane, but I've been CFO, COO, and CEO. So that's kind of an unusual, um, you know, uh, record of having all three of those roles. Yeah. And, and so I, I had gone to um, work for a company in the 90s that was buying ophthalmology practices. It was a venture-backed company. And so I got to work um, inside these small practices with physicians, with their staff, and it was probably more hands-on than I had um, experienced in the past. Mm. And that company um, moved its headquarters from Houston to um, Tennessee, which is where um, the investors were. And so I had an opportunity to consult for a period of time. Mm-hmm. And I um, did physician practice management consulting, um, helping practices improve their performance and setting up physicians in um, solo practice when they were being set up in solo practice. That's kind of changed. Right. Um, but I ended up being asked by um, some colleagues that I'd worked with at Price Waterhouse to help them write a business plan. Um, they were at Texas Children's. And Texas Children's wanted to um, evaluate the feasibility of starting a new company, a subsidiary, that would employ general pediatricians. And they knew that I had been working in the physician space, so they asked me to help um, with that business plan. And so 
I did do that, and and, um, the hospital um, approved the business plan and put away monies um, requested to get that underway. And I was CFO for a year and CEO for 12. So I was in clinics. I was, um, you know, with patients, and and, uh, 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 we had a million visits to our 41 clinics when, um, when I left in that particular organization to go to um, to Houston Methodist wow. and worked again with um, their physicians. And this wasn't just general pediatricians. It was um, everything from pathology, radiology, primary care, and then all the, um, you know, uh, med- medical subspecialties and um, surgical subspecialties. So I was in hospitals, in clinics, and and so yes, you 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 are talking about um, what is the patient's experience? Um, uh, what are they? What are the challenges they're having in terms of accessing care? How long do families have to wait when their kids are sick to get an appointment? Mm. Um, what happens after hours? Um, so all those things that patients are experiencing so that they are able to get access to the care that they need. Um, what is our workforce experiencing and, and what yeah. is the, um, you know, uh, retention of our, uh, of our staff and of the nurses and teams that are there to support the families and, and, um, and provide the care that's essential. And then how do we recruit the best and the brightest in terms of, of clinical talent all the way around? So there was always, um, you know, when you're at Texas Children's, the chairman of my board was um, a, a world-renowned physician, um, Dr. Ralph Feigen, mm-hmm. and um, he, you know, uh, trained the best um, pediatricians, and and so we had access to an incredible um, program, and he was incredibly well respected. So we had the draw of uh, his. You know, mentorship and and his training programs, mm-hmm. and the opportunity for physicians to work at Texas Children's, and so there were a number of levels of, you know, um, involvement and and looking as a CEO at the business holistically, yeah. as opposed to just from a financial lens, which was a step for me. I hadn't anticipated having that opportunity to move into a role where the entire business, its strategy, and all of um, those elements were in my scope of responsibility, albeit with an incredible team and an incredible organization that we're enabling. But you have to look at all the details um, that you you were describing. In those kind of roles, there's no way that it can just be about the, you know, managing the business, right? Because, uh, or I guess I should say, it's never going to be just about managing the business because the business is taking good care of people and hiring and retaining the best clinicians and unavoidable to be uh, a part of that process. And it's so, it's, it is pretty remarkable that you've had an opportunity to play those operational uh, executive and financial roles. Um, One of the things that I've been curious about through the course of your career, because we've talked about um, the fact that your focus now is really on innovation, especially technology-driven innovation. I'm curious about the source of that innovation. So if you, as you look back over your career, um, where does that, where do those new programs come from? Where did the innovations come from? Did they come from the staff? Did they come from nursing teams? Did it come from uh, physicians? Was it coming from outside? And have you seen that change over the years? I know I'm asking you to generalize a lot, but can you characterize that uh, just through the course of your experience? You know, I'll I'll tell you what helped me to sort of um, bring all that together was, um, this will take you back again, 1997 (laughs) Nightline. Um, It was a a segment on IDEO and how um, they sort of went through their um, design thinking process. Mm -hmm. And this is where the whole deep dive um, terminology, I think, became so... um, 
uh, widely used because I think the deep dive actually originated with them. It was one of their processes. So they showed this really messy process of how they um, went through and they had human factors folks and they had, you know, design folks and how does a person experience a, 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 um, a, a shopping cart, a grocery store cart mm-hmm. um, and, and walking with customers to get a sense of well, what would you want out of this? What works? What doesn't? Um, what does it cost to put these things together? The whole comprehensive approach to design thinking and really um, thinking it differently. So um, that was just um, like, I I loved that. It was very inspirational to me and Mm. it gave um, kind of a a process around how to engage in these types of, of, um, you know, projects, endeavors. And um, as years played out, I was at a, a conference and I uh, picked up, I think it was a Business Week magazine that showed that Nemours Children's, one of the other children's hospitals mm-hmm. in Florida, had hired IDEO um, to help them with a facilities project. So mm-hmm. I ended up calling IDEO, and um, we were looking at redesigning the way pediatric care um, could be delivered. We were going to look at facilities. I could have built other um, practices that looked similar to a model that, you know, not particularly new and innovative, um, but by virtue of hiring them, um, they engaged our physicians, our nurses, our um, patients, and it was a fascinating process. We ultimately were invited to present that um, project at Mayo Clinic's um, innovation, the opening of their innovation center some years later. So innovation is, to me, it's, it's listening um, and seeing where ideas, because ideas come from everywhere. They're not, ne- yeah. they're not necessarily my ideas. And sometimes some of the wildest sounding things become the most interesting things. Um, change in healthcare and change for physicians is not necessarily a simple thing to do. Sure. So engaging um, people from, you know, all aspects of, of, um, of the organization who have an interest in, in this and whose lives would be impacted by these sorts of things were um, ways that I navigated change. And sometimes I would have people who were maybe early adopters along mm. with some of those that might have been laggards because you want to have everyone's voice That's right. I- involved to understand how you can um, bring in the change into an organization in a way that um, is, is sustainable. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it, it's, it's not an easy process. It's a bit of a messy process. Right. Um, but um, but it's, it's, it's an, for me... It, it was always an interesting process where I continued to learn from everyone, and hopefully we as a team were able to up our game and um, increase the the um, value of the experience mm-hmm. in our in our facilities as, for everyone, for patients and for our staffs and and clinical teams. So I'm really curious how that experience is now playing out as you're dealing with young companies. We're going to pick that up as soon as we come back from a break. So stick around here on the Data Point podcast. We're going to be right back with Aisha McCracken. Today's show is brought to you by Blue Spire, a full service digital marketing agency focused on complex and highly regulated industries of healthcare, senior living, and financial services. Rapid changes in the healthcare industry are causing consumers to seek out trusted advice, demand more transparency and access to information and content. With over 30 years of healthcare experience, Blue Spire knows how to help you reach, communicate with, and gain trust from these consumers. We help you engage with the right content at every touch point, from the first symptom search to appointment scheduling through care management. Visit us at bluespiremarketing.com to learn how we can help you deliver relevant, engaging content through ever-changing touch points that matter. All right, we are back. You're listening to Data Point. I'm your host, Greg Matthews, and our guest today is Aisha McCracken of Innovate Health Ventures. Aisha, when we went into the break, you were talking about what sounded to me as kind of like kind of an aha experience in terms of really applying 
uh, a 360 degree view using design thinking to innovate better experiences and outcomes in, in healthcare. And I know, you know, having experienced sort of an, a similar aha moment when I joined the Humana innovation team in the, in the mid 2000s, it's a, it is a, an incredibly freeing and liberating thing. I, I'm really curious now um, because you, not too long ago, formed your own company called Innovate Health Ventures. And I'm curious about how your experience in that innovation process has shaped the way that you're now counseling um, uh, companies on you know, how to bring new products to market. And uh, if you can, give us a little bit of a translation into you know, how Innovate came to be and whether those things are related. Yeah, so Innovate came to be following a um, stint back in business school. Hmm. So in 2010, when I was um, C- one, one of those years in business school, I was COO of uh, uh, Houston Methodist Physician Organization. And then in that uh, second year, I was hired away and became um, CEO of Memorial Hermann's um, Physician Organization. In the meantime, I'm going to... Um, uh, UT for their executive MBA program, um, which looking back on it, I'm not sure I would have done that again, but um, it was deliberately done because health systems were getting larger and more complicated. Mm. And, and uh, my interest in technology and, and to solve problems um, by, that, that could be enabled by technology, the solutions enabled by technology was what brought me back to, um, to business school. And to think about solving problems in healthcare, not necessarily from a healthcare sink, but viewing problem solving maybe from lessons from other industries. Sure. So that led to um, stepping out and actually beginning some consulting projects with startups to really start to get into that space and, and understand their world, um, knowing the health um, system world and seeing where these things from a healthcare industry perspective begin to line up, mm. um, if that makes sense. So I, um, shortly after all of that, I um, started advising at Texas Medical Center's Innovation Institute mm-hmm. and um, started to work with um, companies who had digital um, technology solutions. And probably one of the first ones that caught my attention was a nurse avatar and um, who would go home with patients with chronic illnesses, right? So if um, there was a patient in a hospital who um, was, ha- was diagnosed with um, congestive heart failure, mm-hmm. after the episode um, in the hospital, um, they leave the hospital and who manages that patient? Who's able to, to sort of track and make sure that that patient's doing okay and that something isn't starting to slide that then causes a readmission or an emer- emergency room episode? If, if somehow there was some tracking, remote monitoring, some tracking um, while they're not in the four walls of a clinic or a hospital mm-hmm. that could keep the patients healthier and... and, and um, and, and get better outcomes and not use healthcare resources unnecessarily. So this um, avatar named Molly had um, protocols and would collect certain information. It was a, it was a very interesting tool, and, and I'd worked with a company that had a care management capability, but it was a lot of nurses trying to reach patients by phone. And you know, if they got the patient that's great, but is it a patient who really needed their time or not? It was highly inefficient. Sure. So there was, you could see where there was a need for this. Um, the company uh, with this, this product, this technology, bright um, uh, innovators, um, computer science um, folks, natural language processing, I mean, a lot of really great um, technical skills. Um, their ability to take their product and figure out how it got hardwired into a health system was where um, things needed to be bridged. And I'm sharing this as an example because I think there are a lot of really interesting technology solutions 
um, from people who haven't um, lived in the healthcare environment. Mm -hmm. So something that looks like it could be like a Microsoft, you think you can just plug it in and, and it's good to go in a Microsoft office. In healthcare, it doesn't work like that. Right. And so you have to consider who are the champions that you know, would benefit from this technology. How are they going to use it? What are the workflows? How do you show um, a value proposition um, so that ultimately you have actually um, got a successful sale that will um, provide value for your customer? So that that piece of working with um, with startups, I love the innovation, and they think about things. They being companies that aren't constrained by a thirty-something year in healthcare or uh, career in healthcare, they're thinking, um, you know, in 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 unconstrained ways of, mm -hmm. of solving problems. But th those unconstrained solutions have to fit into a um, a pretty complex healthcare environment. And then to be successful, they have to scale. So those are the types of, of, of um, areas where I feel like my experience can add value to young uh, uh, companies who are trying to solve some of these um, very challenging problems in the health oh, system. Absolutely. And I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure they can benefit tremendously from your experience. And of course, I, I'm sure for you, it's got to be tremendously rewarding to see you know, people who are unafraid of tackling these tough problems, um, probably sometimes because they don't know exactly how tough they are. But uh, in any case, it is it is a really inspiring thing uh, to work with folks who are who are doing something new. I had promised up front that we were going to talk a little bit about the Ignite Healthcare Network. And it's it's very exciting because I know you have your, uh, is it the third annual uh, fire pitch competition coming up? We have a third annual fire pitch competition um, coming up in October, October 17th. That event is a culmination of a program um, that is already um, underway soliciting um, the best and the brightest of women-led um, uh, digital health uh, solutions startups. Mm -hmm. And by women-led, um, that's meant to have a female founder, co-founder, a female who has um, a, a C-level uh, position and has equity of 5%. Um, and so they have a significant voice at the table. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that comes from, you know, this idea of how do we um, give women a hand up if they're 40, if they're 80% of the women in healthcare are, are at workers in healthcare are women, how do we get more women into um, these senior positions? How do we advance them in terms of, of um, starting companies? And so some of that motivation, um, the program solicits app uh, applicants now, um, closing applications June 15th, at which point um, companies will be reviewed by their potential customers. So we've created a really unique program where we have um, 11 organizations um, that include health systems like Texas Children's Hospital, like Memorial mm -hmm. Hermann, um, Houston Methodist. We have um, the Menninger Clinic, which is one of the country's leading psychiatric facilities. Yeah. We have um, Gallagher, um, which is one of the country's leading employer benefits consultancies. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Humana um, joining us. We have um, the new medical college at University of Houston that's focused on um, transforming the care delivery model for um, primary care and, and training the primary care physicians of the future. Um, so we've got some incredible partners. We've got more as well, but it's all on our website. Sure. Our partners represent the customers of these innovate, innovative startups. And they will look through our pool of applicants and say, I want to work closely with these companies. And uh -huh. they'll select. So they, there's an alignment there because customers are choosing the um, uh, startups with solutions that they view to be most interesting and most valuable. Interesting. Um, so this isn't just a panel of sort of quote unquote impartial judges that are saying, ah, that looks interesting. These are people who actually are 
looking for solutions to problems. Totally. And when I um, when we came up with this uh, uh, program, um, it was with feedback from um, these customers. And, and the, the CIO of, of Texas Children's is um, a woman, Myra Davis. She's an Ignite member. Mm-hmm. The CIO of Memorial Herman is um, Amanda Hamill. She's an Ignite member. The um, uh, Executive Vice President, Chief Innovation Officer at at Houston Methodist is Roberta Schwartz. She's an Ignite member. So we have our members who are in these um, positions where innovation matters to their organizations, yeah. and they have um, the the strategic um, eye for seeing what's going to bring value into their organizations. And I said to them, Do, "Are there specific problems you want us to, you know, search?" for um, solutions, and they said, no, we don't want to see, uh, we don't want you to search for anything specific. What we want to see is what's innovative. What are we going to, if we look for something specific, we may miss something out there that could be really new and unique. So yeah. um, that's, the, that's the starting point for um, Fire Pitch. Um, that selection process will happen, and by the beginning of July, our um, customer partner program will begin for a 10-week period where um, startups that are selected by customers will collaborate with a multi-disciplinary um, group. So it, this isn't a, an hour call with one person out of a health system. Um, the health systems want to see early-stage companies and want to collaborate. So this mm-hmm. is you know, virtual. Um, it's in person. We have um, companies coming to us from Australia, um, from the UK. Um, we're now starting to look um, possibly in, in Israel. So along with all the, the um, work that's being done in the U.S., we're also looking for talent globally and want to arrange for these interactions so that they can happen virtually and, and, and um, both the startups and their customers can have the benefit of these um, collaborative opportunities. At the end of the 10-week period, there is a, an evaluation process and, um, and the uh, startups will get feedback from the evaluation process and those scoring highest from the evaluation become finalists and um, are invited to pitch live at the Houston, uh, at the Texas Medical Center. And it's a great event. We usually have, I don't know, about 150 people who are um, systems um, uh, executives, who are investors, who are really interested in this space. Um, we intend to probably up that audience by including some um, young women in high schools um, so that they can see what, um, you know, what great uh, role models and um, see some opportunities, see themselves in some of these um, uh, entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs. So um, at the end of the, uh, of the event, we are now putting together prizes, um, but also investment opportunities. So we've got a $50,000 convertible note that'll be given by TMCX. Um, and then we've got two other investors um, that are each um, looking to um, ha- uh, give 25000 in in convertible notes each. So we're hoping to get more prize money out there for the winners sure. of, um, of the event. But it's, it's hopefully a substantial event for the startups, for the customer partners that are um, participating, and then for investors to see better vetted companies um, that are pitching the night of the 17th, the, uh, uh, the night of the fire pitch event. And certainly the, you know, the financial reward is fantastic, but it sounds to me, you know, with most, you know, quote unquote, you know, startup competitions, that's all you get. But to have 10 weeks of interaction with, you know, some of the top folks uh, in the healthcare business, it sounds like a real win-win both for the health systems and for the startups. Um, Greg, I think that's really what differentiates this experience. And and what we want to be known for is um, truly accelerating and giving opportunities to these startup companies um, by virtue of connecting them in a more um, deep way with their with their customers. 
Fantastic. So tell me, I, and I'm just going to fire a couple of quick questions for you because we're uh, nearing the end of our time. It's amazing how fast it goes. Um, number it one, it does go fast. You you referenced a couple of folks who are in senior level positions who are Ignite members. Who should be an Ignite member? You know, if you had a message for Ignite members out there, who who are they? So Ignite members are um, uh, women in C-suite roles. Um, in, in companies that could be healthcare um, focused, you know, could be in health systems, um, provider organizations, payer organizations, venture back companies that are in the healthcare um, services space. Um, but there are also interesting disruptors now, and I say disruptors, but transformational, right? Because mm. one of the missions for um, Ignite is that our members are, are, um, interested in influencing and, and shaping the future of healthcare, transforming healthcare going forward. So Gallagher as a consultancy um, deals with employers having their voice. So senior members, um, uh, folks that are in positions of influence in uh, matters that touch the healthcare industry, Walgreens, Walmart, um, Amazon. Um, we would love to, to connect with companies like that that help to build this ecosystem of women who are in roles of, uh, of influence and have a passion for transforming healthcare. Fantastic. Okay. And then final question. For companies who are interested in learning more about applying for um, the, the fire pitch competition, you referenced the June 15th date. Um, the website is ignitehealthcare.org. What, what else do uh, companies need to know about whether they should be applying? Um, I think they should look at our customer partner page. And when they're putting their application in, it goes in a product or a platform called Gust. It would be great for them to create an application that is targeting some of the customers that they want to be able to, to attract. So um, I think the way that they apply and looking at the customers, because they want to be selected by the customers that are participating in this, um, I think that's the end goal, right? Got it. That, and that makes complete sense. And uh, sharing uh, secrets for success here on the Data Point podcast. I'm, I'm glad to get the uh, behind the curtain view. Um, well, that sounds fantastic. So I am, first of all, so grateful to you, Aisha, for spending the time uh, sharing a little bit of your story with us. And I think the work that you're doing in health innovation, in health technology, and um, certainly advancing the roles of women, uh, it is incredibly powerful. And I hope that a lot of new uh, Ignite members uh, will, will come uh, as a result of this work that you're doing. And I, I hope that you'll uh, have some really tremendous uh, applicants for this year's fire pitch. For the closing message, if you have a company out there that you think would be a good fit for fire pitch, definitely go to ignitehealthcare.org. Aisha, thank you so much. Greg, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to the Data Point podcast. If you like what you've heard, please do rate, review, and share it with your social network. It means a lot. And if you have ideas for show topics or guests, please email them to me at greg at healthquant.health or send a direct message to at Chai Moose on Twitter. That's C-H-I-M-O-O-S-E on Twitter. For more information about this show or any of the terrific healthcare podcasts in the Touchpoint Media Network, check them out at touchpoint.health. See you next time. This has been a Touchpoint Media production. To learn more about this show and others like it, please visit us online at touchpoint.health.